have you found that your knowledge of the law has been beneficial to your painting? The problem I have is I read a lot of books. <laughs> it takes up a lot of time. But I felt like I had to get to a point where it, I wasn't looking up this ginormous mountain, you know. It can be very daunting, but we've all got to start somewhere. And that was the most important thing for me. Hello everyone and welcome to Paint Perspective episode 72. James, we're back at it again with the guests. We are. Yeah, I'm using Joe's seat today. I thought I'd keep it warm for him. Nice, like, nice. Paul's been in it, but I thought I'd, uh, I'd jump over this side. And the reason we are doing that is because we have a very special guest. We have none other than Wolf Lord Rowe, who's joining us. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're punching up again, I think. We are, yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. No, it's really good to have you on the show. Um, I, And I wanted to get you on as uh, I love you love law and your channel is obviously very much heavily invited into that. And, um, and also you very kindly had me on your channel. I think the pandemic, yeah. wasn't it? I think Quite it was a while ago. Was pandemic. Now, yeah. yeah. Um, so a favor was, uh, was definitely owed. Uh, oh, I say favor, uh, getting you on. Uh, it's like a home and away game, basically <laughs> getting, getting, getting you on our, on this side just to come in and have a chat. Cause um, we know that a, a lot of listeners uh, and viewers of the podcast do this while watch us while they're painting and stuff like that. Um, obviously, you do amazing law videos, and, and I'm sure they obviously listen to those as well. But I think just as per the show, getting you on to chat about that and also your hobby and your and a bit of painting stuff as well, I thought would be really good. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, so do you want to tell us a bit about the channel, how it started? Yeah, sure. So Wolf Lord Row obviously is uh, the name of the channel, and I've been doing it maybe six years or so now. It's not something I really keep track of it is it's essentially <laughs> just me with a computer and a microphone mm -hmm. and just talking about the hobby that we all kind of love yeah yeah know. that's it in a nutshell so i do everything from reviewing books to analyzing a particular moment of a story that's just jumped out to me and just talking about where it's all going to go the mm -hmm. future of the hobby what might happen you know uh, my predictions which sometimes are right sometimes are wrong <laughs> um it, you know yeah it's it's just really me talking about what I love. Yeah. And, you know, that's Warhammer at the end of the day. So what made you uh, decide to start doing law videos? Like obviously doing YouTube as a thing is there's all myriad of different things to do obviously on there within the hobby. But what, what was it for you that is it the love of the, the background or what, what thing kind of instigated it? The real instigating thing, like the one thing where I decided to sit down with a microphone and, and talk was because I read a spoiler on Reddit. You know, you haven't, <laughs> you haven't got the book, so you're, you're looking up a spoiler to see what happens. Yeah. And, you know, you read the spoiler and you go, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. And then maybe a few months down the line, I actually read the book. And it was completely different in my mind to what I was expecting, to, to the spoiler I'd read. Yeah, yeah. And so I just kind of thought, well, if I'm interpreting things differently, as we all do, then surely other people are out there doing exactly the same. Yeah. And so, yeah, I just decided to sit down with a microphone and, uh, and talk about it. I think my very first one was probably something to do with Gilliman. Yeah. Because uh, that was kind of the in thing at the time. He was just it when he came back? back, when he first came back? I think, like, I, yeah, yeah, just after he'd just come back is when I, when I started the channel. And, yeah, it just kind of snowballed from there. You sit down with a microphone and you don't expect it to go anywhere, you know. Yeah. And slowly but surely you get these subscribers come in and it just starts building and building and you keep going. Had you ever done any content within anything else before? Like when you was younger, absolutely. was you into video making or anything? No, absolutely not. Just completely fresh. Completely fresh. I feel, like, I feel like you should have known you had like the radio <laughs> voice for it. Like. <laughs> yeah. I, I think for me, one of the, one of the things I really like about your channel and just the types of types of videos and content that you put out is obviously you talk about the law in, 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 in itself, but I think that you hit the nail on the head with what you said and like the interpretation and a lot of the, the videos that I've watched from your channel, you talk about, it's even down to like granular moments, like mm. as an example, just, just putting one out there, like, like for example, the interaction between two Marines in a certain situation and yeah. talking about the perspective from both this, both sides of that conversation or that, that, that engagement between them. I think you've got a really good way of approaching almost like a scene in a film and like yeah. breaking that down and having a bit of a real deep chat about that specific thing. Um, and also, like you said about predictions as well, that's something that was really interesting to me, obviously about your channel and, and, and the types of law videos that you, that you produce. Um, so yeah, so what, what kind of made you do a lot of videos specifically about that type of approach to stuff? It's just things that I find interesting, yeah. you know, and it's the great thing about 40K in particular, it's been going for so long now. It's such a rich universe, you know, and there's so much development in it. You know, it's not just about the big things that happen immediately right now, like Lionel Johnson's comeback, amazing. <laughs> but you can go back 20 years and you can pick out a moment that, uh, to do with Lionel Johnson's history. Yeah, yeah. We didn't know what he was going to do in the heresy, you know. And 
that kind of thing where you can just go back and focus on one tiny little aspect, you know, there, there's not many other universes out there where you can do that. No, true. Yeah. That's very much so. so. What, what was your like gateway into the 40K sort of first? Was it uh, when, well, you, was, when you was young? Edition, or? You know, right, yeah, okay. so the, the good edition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you start creeping up in age, unfortunately, yeah. you, go, you go back to the 90s. And the very first memory I have of Warhammer in general was being bought a Space Crusade box set for Christmas. Yeah. And Space Crusade was kind of like Space Hulk, except it wasn't focused on gene stealers. It had like a mixed match of everything uh, to fight against. And I remember getting that for one Christmas and it all just kind of started from there. I had my next door neighbor who I grew up with was just a year younger than me. So he liked Warhammer as well. So we kind of got in with it. With oh, that's other. great. He had the Blood Angels, Dark Angels Codex. I had the Ultramarines Codex to begin with. And um, yeah. It all literally just spawned from there. We used to play out in the garden uh, rather than a table. You yeah. know, use the grass as jungle terrain. <laughs> Whatever friend was around at the time got stuck with all the orcs and uh, yeah. <laughs> they had to try and face off against our blood angels and ultramarines force, which was probably, you know, way too many thousands of points for them to have a chance with. But when you're a kid, you, you're just kind of exploring, learning and, and just diving into it all. So... Yeah, that's kind of all where it all began. It's a very, uh, very wholesome intro. I think. Yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> so it's good. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we all have a fairly similar way that we that we start as a kid. You yeah, know? definitely. It's, it's, you know, at least back in the day before computer games and awesome cinematics that we get now, you just used to see something and it gripped your imagination, and that's where it all started. Yeah. Did you have the the infamous break? Yes. That everyone speaks about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Late late teens, early twenties. Yeah. I just kind of, you know, you got other stuff going on. Yeah. Women. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and you just yeah. kind of drift away. It's not something you do intentionally, you know, you just kind of drift away from it and then you drift back. And uh yeah. What rekindled it for you? What was what was, what called you back to the light, so it, to speak? <laughs> it was a it was a book. It was the Ultramarines. Uh, Uriel Ventress Omnibus. Oh, wow, yeah. The very first copy. The Grammit I mean, Neil ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the one yeah. that's been re-released dozens of times now. But the first one, I think I probably saw it in like a Waterstones or something like that. I've always loved Warhammer, but, you know, you just kind of drift away from it for a bit. Bought it, read it, absolutely loved it. And yeah, yeah. So it was the lore that kind of brought me back into the hobby. Oh, were, you in, were you into that lore side when you were younger or was it purely just the gaming style? It's, it's the models and the, and the gaming. Well, not necessarily the gaming, but it's just the models that mm. kind of grip you at first. Yeah, yeah. Then you buy your first codex and you start experiencing the lore and you, you kind of fall in love with the setting a bit then. But it was a lot more basic back then. We, we forget. We didn't have all these thousands of novels to go by back then. You literally had a codex and a rule book yeah, and yeah. the rest was your imagination. So I've always loved the lore, you know. Marnius Calgar, like a legendary name that kind of sticks out from the codex. And you've got that old fashioned model that you just dreamed about being able to paint one day. And then a Rabute Gilliman name, it, it's a bit of a mystery back then. You didn't yeah. know anything about him. So you dreamed about what these Primarchs may be. Yeah. And it all just kind of grows from there, you know. Now, do you know, that's one of the one of the interesting things. I think that because obviously like Primarchs are coming back and like there's, there's kind of a little bit of a split in like the, in the hobby and the demographic whereby you got a lot of people that have been there when they were like a mythical thing and like you and it's a name in a codex or a name yeah. in a passage or something like that and you've got people coming into the hobby now that it's just commonplace to have that model and there's yeah. not been that this so it's actually really interesting that to, to to have those two sides of the coin so to speak within yeah. within the industry as well well my question then is so as your channel's been going for quite a while now mm. sort of pre the the pandemic boom that we sort of speak yeah. about have you noticed much of a change in like how people are getting into it now? Like maybe with like your audience, for example, do you find that, I, I know you won't have like perfect insights to who they are, but maybe like from, <laughs> from speaking to the community and whatnot, like, do you find that obviously we speak about a lot of people that grew up in second edition. It's like this thing that you get into when you're young, Yeah. but now obviously we've got a lot of people with the law, with the video games coming into yeah. it, like starting fresh, having never heard of it, like in their twenties, thirties and yeah. so on. So how do you feel about getting into it now? Do you think that it's in... I think it's more accessible place. now yeah. than it's ever been. Um, you know, uh, again, uh, back in the 90s, it was literally because I got bought a Christmas present that spawned my love of Warhammer. I don't yeah. know if I would have ever found it otherwise, you know. Sure, we had games workshops in most town centres back then, but unless you actually went into one, it, it's, it's something you wouldn't discover necessarily, yeah. you know. So it's definitely more accessible now. I would say my kind of fan base has generally been mostly older fans i would say you know they always 
talk to me about old school law and how they got into the hobby and things like that. But you definitely do get newer ones that come in, be it from uh, YouTube or another channel and they stumble across yours and they want to talk about it. Or it, it could literally be a computer game, you know, Space Marines, absolutely massive now. Yeah, and yeah. That will bring in more more people than ever before, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I think we're going to see, and uh, we've said it on countless episodes and stuff, but it's just always good to talk about it with, with new people that come on the show. Like, I think that we're really close now to it obviously being more way way more mainstream with like the likes of amazon and stuff like that i mean obviously mm. we, christmas is around the corner and we've got that that single i think there's a pilot we've got that single episode of uh that um the ultramarine show that's going to be on amazon yep. amazon so there's that i think we're really close to that point now where it is going to go even we're going to see like another resurgence another boom like we did during the pandemic i, I, I imagine just because of it being way more visual and that that thing that you're super passionate about with your channel with the law that I think for me and maybe a, a lot of people, the, the first thing that hooks them is that deep, rich narrative. And I think mm. to see it manifested real on TV and, and see like a, a, like these eight foot genetically engineered warriors yeah, beating and, the crap um, out of things, I think. Also, you know, back in the day when I was into Warhammer, that was seen as like the, the geeky, nerdy thing. Yeah, you yeah. Know? That is so much more acceptable these days. It hasn't got a stigma around it like, like it used to have. Yeah. And it's just absolutely fantastic. So people haven't got to hide their games workshop bag <laughs> when they're walking down the street or something, yeah. you know? That was a very real thing back in the day. It and, was, uh, yeah. It, yeah. It just That just doesn't exist anymore, which is only a good thing. One thing that I've been thinking about a little bit recently, I'm curious for your thoughts on it, is now that, like you said, the law side is like really fleshed out now, it's no longer this thing that supplements the game. It doesn't just supplement the miniatures. Yes. Now it's like its own hobby in itself. And we've spoken mm. about how we think of the hobby as being like multiple pillars. So you've got like yeah. the gaming side. Some people are just into the game. You've got the painting side. Some people are just into the painting. Mm -hmm. The law side, some people are just into the law. And then some people cross multiple of yeah. those. But one thing that I find interesting is, like you said, when you grew up, it was you started out with the game and like the, the law just sort of kept you going and then eventually yeah. becomes its own thing. But now I think with YouTube, with those shows, with the video games, I'm wondering if there's less of a requirement for people to sort of cross paths anymore. If it's like, you could just get into the law and then that's just your hobby and you never pick up a paintbrush or you never roll any dice. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, like It's kind of becoming its own hobby. And I think that in a way they're almost, maybe not intentionally, but like becoming like more segregated in a way. Because you've got like these channels that they're not just a mix of everything. It's like your channel, for example, it's just law stuff. And yeah. that can just be like your whole universe. And then channels like ours, we don't really speak about law and things like that. We not mostly speak about painting. Yeah. And then you've got, do you see the what I mean? Side. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. I'm not sure it's segregated, uh, but they definitely encapsulate its own, its own section, I would say. And you definitely get people that only experience one arena of it. 100%. I get people talking to me all the time that they're into the law, they're into the books, but they've never dived into the model side or, or played a game of Warhammer on a tabletop. You know? So there's definitely people out there. And like you said, because it's expanded so much now, you can do that. Yeah, I, I think I, do. You know what? I think it, I, I couldn't imagine reading the novels. Uh, maybe it's just a personality trait from, from of me, but I couldn't imagine reading the books and see these amazing scenes and like all these characters and things that happen and not look at the models and go, "I've got to create that." Got, that's uh, the great thing about it. That's the hook. But like, I, 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 but I totally get it. Like, you know, obviously with time and stuff being being uh, quite good, obviously important. But like, yeah, I, I, I would find it very difficult to just. I'm definitely one of those cross pollinators that goes across yeah. multiple parts of i think it. most like, people are yeah 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 no I, I i think the law is something that like it is the biggest fishing hook ever like it just it pulls you into it so much but um mm. but yeah it's really interesting that that there are like lots of people that just like that area of it and they're quite happy just immersing themselves in that and that is yeah. the escapism that they, they they enjoy it for if that makes sense i don't think it's a it's a problem necessarily though i don't think there's necessarily even even a requirement for that yeah, i just course, find it yeah. quite interesting how it's like changing over the years. Yeah. 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 And that, again, I think you nailed it because it's expanded so much. And beforehand, that wasn't even an option, really. You know, you, yeah. had, your, you had your codexes and, and that was it. Yeah. Um, now you've, ugh, I dread to think how many novels Black Library must have. It must be into the thousands, <laughs> way yeah, into so, the yeah. thousands, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and again, that's only a good thing. Yeah, definitely. So one thing I'm interested in then, as this is a paint perspective, of course, <laughs> let's get a little bit of like a background on your sort of hobby side of it yeah uh, so starting out like what was your was you, was you like really enjoying painting the models and stuff when you was a kid well yes but yeah there's a big but so um 
Yeah. So again, I, I grew up with my next door neighbor. We were both into Warhammer. We, it was fantastic because we we're both collecting our armies, learning painting at exactly the same time. The problem was, however, was that my next door neighbor's dad decided to start painting his models for him. And I don't know what he was now, but back then to me, they were like godlike miniatures, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and there's me, the equivalent of dunking the model in the paint pot, you know, uh, not good at all. So it was, it kind of spawned my love of beautifully painted models, but it also had the converse effect of looking at my own ones and going, man, <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't quite there. Uh, what I wanted them to be. So, um, looking back then, was he someone who'd done like scale modeling and stuff like that? Uh, and he had that yeah. other experience I or, I, you know, he's, yeah. he's just my, my mate's dad. So, uh, <laughs> I saw him every day, but I didn't really know much about him, you know, um, but he was a policeman, you know, he was into his more macho guns and things like that. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, he, uh, yeah, he, he just, I don't know. He just sat down. He loved, he obviously loved painting because he painted them for him. I don't even think my, my friend asked him to. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, so he just ended up with this beautifully pro-painted army and there's me and my little ultramarines and whatever else. But yeah, that's where it all started, you know, and I feel like most people, you, you enjoy painting. Back in the day, I'd, I'd sit down in the living room, get a VHS out of, I don't know, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves and put that on if I was painting fantasy or yeah, yeah, Starship awesome. Troopers if I was painting 40K, you know, it's the kind of the closest thing we had back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. I'd say even now that's actually pretty close. It holds I, I, up. I, I think. still think Starship Troopers is the closest I think it holds film up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Literally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I, I, he was living the life of Riley, getting his models painted for him by his dad. Uh, like, for free as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so that's where it all kind of started for me. And then, yeah, I kept it going. Uh, you know, back in then, I didn't really follow tutorials or anything like that. So I didn't really know what I was doing. It was just yeah, you know, that's fun, fun painting the model. And then you kind of move, like I said, you take the break, you move out of it. And when I came back in, it was the law that dragged me in. And it's only really recently that, I've got a lot better at being consistent at sitting down to make sure I start painting. You yeah. Know? As I've bought so many models over the past six, seven years and they're still sitting in boxes. You know, I've got battle forces from the Christmas battle forces going back <laughs> for, for years that have been unopened. And, you know, I'm going to start that. A few years ago, I bought an entire Sylvan F army to get me into Age of Sigma that I started building and then gave up because they were so fiddly. And yeah, so it's, it's been a stop and start since I came back in. Yeah, yeah. And say over the last six months, once I, I bought a desk, I chopped it in half to fit it into my room. So I had a set up painting station and that's really helped me. And now yeah. I'm, I'm starting a Crimson Fist army. Oh, amazing. Working through that and not the best, you know, but I'm, I'm making sure I keep consistent and uh, yeah, just keeping going. Because I think that's the main thing, isn't it, at the end of the day? You just got to... Get that consistency, otherwise you're never going to get anywhere. No, totally. So what, what is your, um, so obviously we always talk about like one of the good things for when it comes to actually approaching a project is to have a, like a goal or, a, or like a target of what you want to achieve with it. So Crimson Fist obviously had a really, really interesting chapter as well. What what, what was it the for, for what's your goal with the project and what what made you choose that chapter? So my, my, well, the law, law side of it always helps. Yeah, that's you know, fine. You've, yeah. you've, got to, you've <laughs> got to love the chapter that you're painting for me. That's yeah, a, a big 100%. thing. But I really sat down and, you know, I accepted the fact I'm not the best painter in the world. I've got a big collection of lovely painted models, but they're most I've had commissioned or, or just bought over the years. And I want to be able to do that myself, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day. It's all well and good having this big, massive collection. But if I'm not, I don't know, it feels like it's missing something if mm -hmm. there's not something that I've contributed to it myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just sat down, chapters I love, but more importantly, ones that I thought were realistic for someone just starting out again to be able to paint well. Mm -hmm. And so that was really the criteria for me. And that's why I kind of landed up on Crimson Fist. So not the best, but, you know, I went to Color Forge Primer. I found the blue for Cantor Blue, so yeah. I didn't have to do it black. I could use that, the blue, to go from there. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, it's, it's a simple scheme. It's a chapter I love. And it's something I feel like with a bit of mastery, I can, I can get there. Yeah, no, definitely. I think they're a really interesting chapter, actually, because I'd say they're quite a quite an iconic one if you think of the cover of Rogue Trader for example and, and even the third edition Marine Codex like yeah. they're I think they're they're I think they're a bit of an un, un an overlooked chapter being honest and their scheme mm -hmm. like you said is quite interesting where they're all blue and then they've got the red hand as well I they think used they, to be they, the sort of poster boys back in the day didn't they yeah yeah, yeah. they did yeah they, they like I said they were on the cover of Rogue Trader and, and they 
they kind of almost redone the Rogue Trader cover, but with third edition Space Marine Codex. Mm, so yeah. it's, it's quite good. Um, so what's, what's your goal with the project? Do you want to do it as like a, a gaming army or is it just something to have yeah, on no, a shelf? Yeah, no, gaming. It's been the main point of... <laughs> I've always loved having a collection when yeah. I, I, most of my room's taken up with books, but you know, I've got a, a big, fairly ex extensive collection now. There's uh, there's no sitting there on display as well. And the main point of me getting that collection over the years wasn't just for display because I've got more models than I can display now, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's to play is to get back into sitting down or standing up at the table and, and gaming. Yeah, yeah. Is that one thing that you haven't returned to? Yeah. I've, yeah. Uh, we've had a little kind of, drop-ins every now and again but i want to do it properly you know yeah, I, really, yeah. I really miss gaming and so but the main thing is you get older you move away it's not easy to bring your your, your whole army around your mate's house or necessarily the whole time so my plan was to get a massive collection so they don't have to bring their models to me we can use my collection to game yeah. oh that's really cool and, yeah. yeah so essentially that's uh, been the purpose of it and so this crimson fist one will be a fully fully game worthy crimson fist army using the big back collection of models I've got sitting, <laughs> sitting uh, waiting to, to be painted. Yeah, no, fair. Has the law been a, a motivational factor in that, in that then? So as someone who like is reading a lot and obviously mm. for your videos and whatnot as well, and I'm sure you've read a lot about the Crimson Fist and that's how you yeah. landed there. Is there like particular stories and narratives and like characters and things that like drove you to that and like kept you motivated to keep going and do you, do you read about a character and you go oh, i really want to do them now and it like fires yeah. you up and then that, that's the problem you read yeah. a book you love it and you come out going well i want an army of them now don't yeah. i you know, and that's, <laughs> it's just the way it goes and especially for someone like me who's particularly passionate about the law this you read a great book you come out the other side immediately wanting to start an army of them but there's only so many armies you can you can keep going at one time. So I know that problem. <laughs> <laughs> the Crimson Fists have got they haven't got the biggest the biggest backstory in the world. It's fairly centered around what happens around Rin's world. Yeah, yeah. But what they've got is absolutely fantastic. It's awesome. It? Yeah. Pedro Cantor is one of the best characters in the law. If you take the time to really sit down and read their lore and their backstory. And so that's that was definitely a motivating factor for me. It had to be an army that I loved yeah. because if you haven't got the love for them, it's going to become a chore. You're going to, you're going to end up fading out and not following through at some point in it. So had to be something I loved, had to also match with the, the technicality difficulty for me. For the listeners then, if you're someone who's maybe just starting out with the law, or maybe even just starting out in the hobby and you yeah. haven't found that thing yet, I, I hear a lot of people, especially in our discord community speaking about like, I want to get started in this. And I'm like, they're trying to choose an army and they're almost like looking for an excuse to get like pulled towards something. Sure. Yeah. What would you say is something like, what's some advice for them to maybe like find that chapter that they fall in love with or find that army or, you know, faction. Well, the, that's a tiff, That's a, that's a tricky one because you can't choose what chapter you fall in love with. You just, it's just instinctive. You know, my, my first army was ultramarines. And then one day I, I one day I bought the space Marine codex and I just fell in love with the space wolves. So you can't, you can't really dictate the direction that you're going to go in. However, I think it helps if you kind of decide, like me, where it is you want to start. Mm. Be realistic with yourself. You know, is it worth choosing a chapter where it has got the most complicated color scheme, like Nova Marines, where you've got to, you've got to paint the sections of their army? You're immediately putting yourself at a handicap to, if, you, if you're just starting out somewhere. So be a little bit realistic with yourself. But then... Just dive into the law. It doesn't have to be a novel. It can be a codex. That's where it all began for people back in my day. You just read a codex. Something happens and you fall in love with one. Yeah. So and in this day and age, you don't even have to do that. You can you can go on audio Google, yeah. audio books. You can go on YouTube. I'm, there's loads of channels out there that talk about particular factions. You can go on something like Mime where I talk more about moments. Yeah. You will guarantee there'll be something in it that will that will just ignite that spark inside you and that's where it will begin. I, I remember in some of the uh, earlier codexes, like in second, third, even fourth edition, in some of the, some of the, especially like in Marine codexes or even mm -hmm. some of the other, other uh, sort of army books, you'd always, always have like on the left hand column, you'd have like a snippet, almost yeah. like a short, if that makes sense. They, they still do that now because I was actually, uh, I bought the, the current, like the new Blood Angels uh, army box. And that was, even though I've been painting for years and I've painted loads and loads of armies, I've never had a gaming force or anything for myself. It's always been commissions and other right. projects. 
And that was my first codex that I'd ever read. It was only a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I haven't gone like fully covers cover, but that they're actually still doing that now. So in the first couple of pages, it was because I'd always had this expectation that the codex was the book with all of your rules. Yeah. And it would tell you like what specific transfer you've got to put on, like and all that <laughs> stuff the that I did. Boring stuff. <laughs> exactly. <here. laughs> but then opening that up and seeing that not only was there loads of like inspirational artwork and like painted miniatures by the, the art these days exactly. is absolutely astounding. Yeah. It's yeah. Really good. But not only that, there was like the, these really nice self-contained like shorts, yeah. Yeah. short stories. And I think that that's like a perfect amount, I think, for someone to kind of decide if they're interested or not. That it, that, that, yeah. That's the thing. And it is, I don't think you even think it's like the grand narrative of the chapter or the race or the faction that sometimes will be that hook or captivating moment for you to fall in love with them. But my first art, my first marine, non-Blood Angel Marine Army was the Hawk Lords. And I, and I read, um, I read there was a short where it talks about like a Hawk Lord Marine doing something. It was either in an audio, in a, in a, in a novel, like one, you know, they used to do the black, the early black library novels where they had loads of short stories yeah. in one book. In one of them, I think it was either about a Death Watch kill team or it might have been, I can't remember the exact scenario book it is. I'll have to see if I can remember it and we'll put it up or put some notes on it. But Hawk Lord intervenes in a moment and does something amazing. And that just hooked me at that moment in time. Like, yeah. And then it made me go, oh, I want to find more about them, found out about them, saw the color scheme and then fell up. So I don't even think it needs to be the overall encompassing this chapter, this army. It can be an action or deed, which ties in really nicely to your channel yeah. about an individual moment that makes you think, oh, that 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 that, ca that character or that that guy's amazing. Yeah, you, know you I mean? can't like, define it. Yeah, you can't exactly, define it. Yeah. It'll just be something that, that absolutely grips you, and that's yeah. where it'll all that will begin. Yeah. And it won't be, it won't just be one thing either. But once you're into the hobby, <laughs> it's got its claws into you. There'll like be more and, more and more and more and more. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, one thing I'm curious to is. I find that I'm perhaps at a little bit of a disadvantage sometimes when it comes to painting certain projects that I'm not overly familiar with. Sure. So <clears> if <throat> I get, for example, a, a commission for like an Eldari force and I've not been given, say, a ton of guidance from from the client, for example, not having that established like knowledge base of like yeah. certain attributes of like what that force is like and like obviously colors and things like that as well but have you found that like your knowledge of the law has been beneficial to your painting i think that is always a, a good thing even for just something simple like space marines you know if you know the chapters you you know the markings you'll know if they're not particularly a codex adherent chapter they're going to have different markings space walls for example yeah, yeah you know so that'll only ever be a good thing um and i think also that if you're into the law you don't feel as constrained by it. And I know that might sound a bit strange, but once you know the law and your imagination's firing, you realize that you can, you can create your own things to fit within that law. Yeah. And you can, you're, you're free to experience a bit more. So yeah, from, from a simple thing like chapter markings, for example, if you, if you know the law, you haven't got to worry about flipping through the codex. Crimson Fist, for example, I know, you know, it's one hand is the red, unless it's a veteran sergeant, and then, and then it's the two. So it's simple things like that. But then it also opens the pathway for you to be a bit more freer. And I guess it kind of removes the worry. Mm. If right. You know what I mean. Yeah, it's kind of like that adage of like, once you know the rules, you know how to break them. Kind of yeah. 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 Good. yeah, that's a good, good analogy. We frequently hear from you with questions asking how you can paint like our team of world-class and award-winning artists. Teaching is something that all of the team here at Siege are very passionate about, and we want to share with you the methods and techniques that we use to paint every single day all of the incredible miniatures and armies that you have seen from us. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalogue of over 300 step-by-step -step tutorials covering a huge variety of colour schemes, miniatures, painting styles, and techniques, from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios what would your advice be then for someone who like maybe they are a painter and they've done a lot of painting what are some entry points perhaps for them to expand that that law knowledge how to get into the law yeah as as, as a painter specifically so say you're say you're someone who really really enjoys the painting mm. maybe you even have a an army or two what 
but I think a lot of people are quite intimidated by the books. I think yeah. I was especially, especially when you think of like, for example, oh, I've, I've heard about the horse heresy. Let's have a look at that. Oh, there's like <laughs> 70 books. Great. Yeah. Uh, and then you're like- well, At least they're in number order. <laughs> yeah. But then there's arguments about that. It's like chronological order and whatnot. I mean, True, yeah. so what, do you think that there's some perhaps uh, segues that are a bit more friendly for, for Absolutely, newbies? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's quite a common, there's two main themes of people reaching out to me over the years, ever since I've started the channel. One is just people thanking me for the channel because it, you know, just sitting down, chatting to listen to me, chat law, it's helped them get through tough times, you know, and that's something you never even think about when you're sitting down to chat on a, on a yeah. microphone. But secondary is that um, people reach out to me asking how to, to get into the novels or where to begin. How do I get into the law? And everyone's different. There's no set pathway for you. But my general advice is that Black Library's kind of got you covered now goes back to the fact that this is so established universe over the past 20 years or so. We've got omnibuses now of pretty much all the main factions. Mm. And they're quite old now, so they're a bit more easy to read, a bit more simplistic than some of the novels you get these days where yeah. you, you worry about knowing all the terminology or what else is going on in the universe. You can go, you can pick up a, a Uriel Ventress Ultramarines omnibus, which has got about two omnibuses now. Blood Angels, Space Wolves, Pretty much any faction out there has got its own omnibus now. And I always say, if you just want to dip your toe in, buy one of them because they're easier to read and they're more than one story. Mm -hmm. The problem is if you buy in one book, sometimes it's not enough. You're left loving a character, but you can't continue the journey with them. The omnibus will take you all the way through. Yeah, You've got at least three books in there to read. And by the time you come out the other end, so I started in the hobby, I was... Well, in, in the in the books, it's exactly how I I ended up where I am now, talking about it pretty much every day on the channel, because you love it, and it's being able to follow the characters the whole way through a journey that it just adds that little bit more. That's why the Horus Heresy is so successful, because it's not just one book. How many years has it been going for now? Like we're over a decade. Easy. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah, and it's because we've followed all these main characters all the way through. Yeah, and, that, and that's. That's the key to, to a successful story and bonding with the characters. Yeah. So that's how you get into it. I'd like to flip that on its head then. <laughs> if you are someone who's, say, a big fan of your channel, quite into the lore, mm -hmm. but you're new to the painting side of things, mm -hmm. what would you say is perhaps a good avenue to go down if you're looking to get started in the painting and modeling? What would you suggest for them? Um, well, it depends on what kind of avenue we're talking. If it's like buying the models or where you want to start painting, you've all got to start somewhere, you know? So again, if you're coming from the law that you've already got the love there, so there's going to be something that's already gripped you that has made you a fan of the law. Just follow that. You know, it's don't be daunted because you, you can go out there, you can look at your beautiful painted models, for example, and it can be very daunting. Like me when I was a kid and my next door neighbor, <laughs> there's me with my just blue ultramarines and he turns up with this beautiful blood angels army, you know, it's, it can be very daunting, but we've all got to start somewhere. Here's me as been a fan of the hobby for, I don't know, 30 years now. And I'm still a beginner at painting, you know, but that doesn't, that doesn't mitigate your love of the hobby. It, if anything, enhances it because you've still got a journey to take in it, yeah. you know. So just follow your heart in that, you know. Buy, buy a model of whatever it is that you love. Get the basic paints and just, just sit down and get cracking, you know. One thing that I really love about this hobby, Joe spoke about this actually on a previous episode. I can't remember quite which one, but it's the fact of this is one of the few hobbies and interests where people on the upper end of it are very, very open and honest about where they started. Mm. No one's really hiding the fact of when they, if anything, it's celebrated that, yeah. hey, by the way, when you start, like you're not going to be great at this. <laughs> Everyone's very, very open to that and very, very accepting of that. And there's kind of no expectations that, when you pick up the paints for the first time, you're going to be great. Or even the years in, you're going to be great at it because some people just aren't perhaps as interested in it or, you know, perhaps they haven't got the dexterity because of a myriad yeah. of reasons and whatnot. But I think it's, even though there are a lot of amazingly painted models out there, everyone's still really, really accepting of yeah. anything on any of that spectrum, if that makes sense. If you show up to the, to the gaming club with a, you know, a, I don't want to be rude, but like a, a poorly painted army. Yeah. No one's really going to say anything. There's not really any judgment no, there. No. Everyone's 
as accepting of you as if you'd shown up with an amazingly painted army. Yeah. Because everyone's just excited about the fact of you're in the same, you're into the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The models. Yeah. Do, do you know one of the things that I, I, I also want to throw into the mix and just, just I put on the floor to discuss is like, I think actually the law is a really good thing to motivate you to paint and practice to get better. And the reason for that is because you have such an, 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 an enamored love for the chapter or for the character or for the models for example you it kind of puts you in the position of wanting to paint them yeah. as best as possible if that makes sense and i think that's one of the things you want your painting to live up to the stories and the yeah. the artwork and you do have you obviously you, you, like you said quite 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 frankly like you see stuff online like oh my god i'm never gonna be able to paint like that but i think that like what you said about people being quite open and honest about, well, here's my first model. He says, I, there's plenty of times when you're on socials, on Instagram or on Facebook, whatever, in groups, and you see someone doing like the 10 year difference between their paintings. You exactly, see the first yeah. model and like 10 You don't see basically. Cristiano Ronaldo posting a video of him being <laughs> terrible at football. <laughs> yeah, do you know what exactly, I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. And I think that's one of the things. I think that the the good thing about it is that that that, that connection that you have with the race faction miniature or sculpt or whatever it is and that that story or law that backs that up the miniature because it's got it's the, the, the story or the law gives that miniature a soul do you know what yeah. i mean and i think that's one of the things that i think really helps with painting because it kind of not forces you but it kind of aids you in kind of like trying to do the best you can with it to, to yeah. represent that that model essentially or your army is an effigy of the thing you love. Does that make sense? Yeah, and absolutely. I, and I think, yeah. I think, and I think that's one of the things that I really love about the hobby in general and just painting the Warhammer miniatures and painting is having that really solid foundation of a great story that gives you purpose in the painting. Does that make yeah. sense? No, you know? absolutely, so, yeah. so yeah. We're extrapolating on the, the motivation thing that you brought up there, James, you, you said earlier about how you struggled a little bit with, with staying motivated to paint. Mm. And then they, you spoke a little bit about like having a hobby set up and things like that. What are some things that you've perhaps done or changed to keep motivated to paint? Cause you said now that recently in the last six months, you said you've been getting more back into it. Yeah. Where are maybe some things that you found you was going wrong before that, that sort of hindered your ability to it's, keep it going? The problem I have is I read a lot of books. So <laughs> <laughs> it takes up a lot of time. So for me, a time issue is always, uh, it's always been an issue. Yeah. So I love reading the books. I think that's a really common thing for a lot of people, especially yeah. with like family and kids yeah. and whatnot as and well. I love audio books too, but the problem is I, and if, if I'm doing something else, I kind of get distracted. Yeah. And that's my personal, the best time for me to look at, uh, listen to an audio book is when I'm walking the dog, for example, you know, headphones in and hour walk and away you go. Mm. But other than that, I generally prefer to, to read the book. Mm. And so again, you I'm, I'm a fast reader, but it still takes a, a, quite a while to read a book. Yeah, yeah. And so that for me, it was just kind of a juggling act, a balancing time. You put your paints away into a box, your models away. If they're not there, out of sight, out of mind. Mm. It's, it's a very easy thing to fall into, even when you start with the best of intentions like we all do. So for me, it really was as simple as getting, the, getting them out. I've got my lovely painting models out there, but... I needed to see my project, what I was working on. Otherwise, again, I'm just not going to crack on with it because I've got other things to be worrying about. Like, what am I going to talk about this week? What do I fancy talking about? You know, so I've got, there's a lot more things going on in your head. It doesn't even have to be a great big fancy desk set up. You know, I literally went to Ikea. I bought a desktop where you stick the legs on the bottom. I sliced it in half because it stuck out too far. And then I just shoved it uh, on the side of the wall against the, the window next to my computer desk. So when I'm sitting there with my setup, when I'm recording, I've literally got all my paint project right there next to me now. That's awesome, and yeah. That is really the simplest thing I could have done that changed me from stopping and starting every six months to keeping going. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. We spoke about that um, a little bit recently, I think. We had a, we had a question from the community saying uh, about like, having a dedicated hobby set up and whatnot. And that was, that was my advice was everyone's, Obviously, not everyone is in a fortunate enough position to have like a dedicated like room in their house to have have a yeah. setup. But one thing that I actually advocate for as well is any friction you can remove from that. So it, for a lot of people, that might mean um, there's some really great like travel cases yeah. for you to put like all of your paints and all of your models in. Even having like that, so that when you go, if you are somebody who has to use your kitchen table to paint, yeah. Just having this case that you can just open and bosh, it's done. Well, it like, literally yeah. transforms and creates that setup yeah. instantaneously, yeah. you know, which, which I think gets rid of that. Oh, I've got to get it all out. I've got to, like, it's like bang, lift the lid down, it's there. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I would so, imagine as well that if you're finishing off a book and you're feeling really, really fired up, <laughs> just having the models literally right there is like. Exactly. Yeah. yeah you know, it's, 
again, that's where the law and the, and the tabletop all kind of blends into one, doesn't it? That's the fantastic thing about the universe, you know. But even just what you were talking about, even something as simple as maybe setting an alarm on your phone when you know you're going to be free yeah, will be the, the little reminder that you need to actually sit down and do it. Yeah, that's really good advice, I think, uh, Mega. So, so going back to your, your Crimson Fist, you, you, so how much law are you transferring from stuff you've read? I mean, I know no, probably nowhere near as much as you regarding Crimson Fist. I know, I know about Rinsworld. I know obviously about obviously the Orcs and stuff and like the, the famous land raider that drove around by itself for a while. And there's a character I remember from back in the day that disappeared. And I don't know. I don't know what happened to him. And I'm sure in the Pop quiz. you, you uh, put you on the spot here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but I'm just wondering, like the first part of the question is like, how much law are you transferring into your painting project? So like, are you like taking characters from books and things like that and creating miniatures for them or, or like, uh, the model, the character I wanted to bring to the table was um, uh, was Captain Cortez. So yeah, I, I, knew, I knew he was that. So I remember Cortez back from third edition in the Codex. He had that famous that the sort of like grim dark artwork of him where he's like it's a facial portrait yeah, and yeah, he's yeah. got a bit it was always always made me laugh because it was like rogue from x-men he's got like black <laughs> hair and then he's got this white chunk of hair like where he's like got a stripe or something in his head so is that like a character that like I, is that a character that you've thought about adding to the force because he kind of disappears doesn't he if memory serves correct it I may be wrong, but I could have sworn he died. And there's some, maybe I'm wrong. I may need to reread. I, I, I'm not sure. That's why, because I, I thought the moment you said Crimson Fist, I was like, I'm sure that, it, well, hopefully you might know about it. But if you don't, that's amazing. Because yeah. like, it's, I, de- I still want to know about it. But, I'll expand um, on that though. Are there some like characters from the books and stuff that you're maybe adamant on including in miniature form? Not or? yet, but definitely that's a long-term goal. Uh, I think, again, that's the, the fantastic thing about the hobby that you've got those characters that yeah, um, yeah. that you, you, you love and you obviously, if you going into painting them, you want to field an army on the tabletop, you're going to want those names and characters in the force. But um, again, for me at the moment, I'm still very much at the path of, of learning, practicing, getting better. Mm. And then that's the goal, isn't it? You know, putting those, putting Cantor on the field. I can't not have Pedro Cantor in a Crimson <laughs> Fist army, you yeah. know. Hopefully I'll have a new model by then, otherwise I'm going to have to look at kit bashing because I can't stand the scale difference. That, yeah. that really bugs me in the army. So, yeah. Uh, I think that's a definite long-term goal with the force. I think that's a great thing about the hobby. But for me personally, at the moment, it's more of a working towards kind of goal. You know? Have you got a favorite character from a book or piece of artwork and thought to yourself, if only that had a miniature? Custom Service is our character creation brand here at Siege Studios. Custom Service is not just a kit bash. We create miniatures using traditional hand sculpting alongside conversion for entirely unique and bespoke miniatures that will blow you away. Our talented team of sculptors methodically and meticulously bring your thoughts into reality with the precise, refined and sharp work you'd expect from a digital sculpt and pair that with our world-class painting team for an incredible display piece you'll be proud to own. To bring your character to life and get a quote now, head to siegestudios.co.uk or head to the link in this episode's description. I'm going to admit something very, very nerdy, and I'm quite happy to do it uh, specifically because we've got a lot of obviously a, a more someone who deals more with law. When I read novels and I read the books, specifically, obviously the Blood Angel ones, be it in the Heresy or be it like the the uh, James Swallow trilogy, um, or, or, I um I write down the names of the of the Marines so like when it says okay, like yeah, yeah I write, I've got a, a, a notes on my phone where I literally write down as I'm reading the novel. You've got your own Blood Angels name generator. Well, yeah, yeah, I have literally, yeah, because I, I think it's really nice to actually pull from the source material yeah. to, to add those names for, like, for a sergeant or for uh, things like that. So problem, and it's, very, it's very nerdy, but like, I'm quite happy to admit that. No, it's fantastic. <laughs> like, the problem is with Crimson Fist is that most of them die. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, there like, is that, yeah. You could do them all as a veteran force, I guess, yeah. but it doesn't always work out depending on the story. No, definitely. Maybe that's an example of how the factions differ, though, because you've got some that are a little bit more ambiguous where you can like create your own head cannon and characters around them yeah and then you've got some other factions where here's like 30 baseline characters yeah but even even something simple as like uh captain Tycho for the blood angels technically he's not around anymore but he's such an iconic character you can just theme your force for when he was still around yeah you know? 100%. So, yeah so on your painting then what has been your uh approach to the practice and the sort of learning because one thing that i'm quite interested in is i found and this is going to differ for everyone obviously but i found Doing the army is actually what made it a little bit more stressful and counteractive to practice in the painting, if that makes sense. So when I was starting out or getting back into it, rather, having this daunting task of this force that I'd built and I had to paint all of them, yeah, trying to balance that with, I want to practice my brush control and get better at painting. I found that 
practicing that was a bit easier to do on, on an individual basis, like mm -hmm. just painting individual characters. So I'm interested, are you like batch painting forces, like squad at a time, or are you just yeah. focusing on individual models and building to this bigger thing? So for this particular time, I've tried it both ways previously, but for this time that's kind of worked out for me, it was batch building the entire force and then batch priming them all in the blue. Mm. And then they felt like Crimson Fists. Uh, might sound a bit strange. No, no, it makes sense. The second you've got that blue on, they feel like Crimson Fists. So then there's, it's much more enticing. You feel like you haven't got as far to go. It's not as an uphill struggle to get there. So that was the core. I've, I mean, I've got a million more models waiting to go. <laughs> <laughs> You're but, in good company. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I built enough so it felt like an army. Yeah. You know, and I, I sprayed them so it felt like an army. And then once you get that done, then I think the rest, by the time I get there, the rest will come a lot more naturally. But I felt like I had to get to a point where it, I wasn't looking up this ginormous mountain, you know. Yeah. I felt like I had a base mm -hmm. and that was the most important thing for me. Amazing. And in terms of like painting style, how are you approaching that? Have you tried any different sort of ways of painting or are you sticking to box art style? If I can get anywhere remotely near box art <laughs> style, but I'm very much just sticking to kind of like the battle ready kind of tutorial at the moment. Yeah, because yeah. again, I don't want to set myself a task and then feel deflated by the end of it. Yeah, of course. So I want to uh, set myself a goal where that I feel is attainable. And, you know, the, the battle ready, yeah, unless you've got it in your display cabinet, you're just playing on a table, which is my goal. Yeah. They look absolutely fine. Yeah, you know, exactly. If you can get there. So... That's, that's my goal. I'm just kind of, again, I've got the blue to prime, makes it a lot easier for me when I'm just starting out. And then I'm just very simple, you know, sticking to the blacks, the silvers, the reds, obviously for the crimson fists. And other than like the highlighting blue, that's about it. That's all yeah. I need. Yeah, yeah. So it's very straightforward. The good, the good thing with getting it to that standard as well is that like, as you, as you progress as a painter through doing repetition and doing all the parts of the army, you can easily go back and then go oh today i'm going to work on this on them and, yeah. and add this onto them and you can always notch them further forward in where you want them to get to eventually incrementally rather than yeah be faced with setting yourself such a massive everest hurdle with like you paint one and you're like i painted it to this amazing standard i'm super now i've got 600 more to do yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so, and so, it can be a bit like it can be a bit like that yeah when you know you're just doing the, the blacks and you've got to try and get in between all the armor plates and you know you've spent half an hour doing that you put that down you turn oh my god i've got all these more to go <laughs> you do get those moments even if you're not like the best painter in the world but yep. again this it's just part of the journey you know yeah. have you got like a favorite part of painting and the hobby like is there a specific task that you enjoy the most no, and it, is there something that maybe you don't like yeah doing? I, I really am not a huge fan at the moment of the building process that okay. is uh that's my chore to, to, to get them all built, to get them all built and then, and then move over that. Once you can start painting, once you get that spray on, <laughs> then, then you feel like you're getting somewhere. But I mean, I, I'm kind of a bit of a contradiction in myself is that I don't like the easy build models because I like the idea of being able to customize them right. a bit and, yeah. and, and make them a bit more unique, but then I'm, I don't like the building. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a contradiction, but the building's definitely the hurdle for me. The edge highlighting. When when I get to the point where I'm trying to do the edge highlighting, that's the thing where I feel like, oh, yeah, I'm painting now. You know, I'm, I'm getting somewhere. Um, yeah, and it's amazing how much difference a tiny little edge highlight can bring to life a model. It, I don't know. It takes it from just this model that you're looking at to a, to an actual character, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. It's oh. really interesting when we get people on here to talk about their perspectives on things like that because it's. It, again, it speaks to how there's so many different pillars and avenues in this hobby that people love is I know some people that absolutely love building. They're yeah. first into build the models and then they don't want to paint them. That's <laughs> like, that's the hurdle. And then you've got people that like yourself who just, if all the models could just come pre-built, that'd be amazing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, and then equally, like I said, even going further out, you've got people that just love to game and the hobby side of it doesn't interest them and so on. It's really interesting. Do, do you know, it really interests me actually that you're, the building side of it for you isn't the bit that you're like, your you're most favourite. Not that there's a right or wrong at all whatsoever. Like it's, it's because I, for me, when I'm building stuff, I feel that that's me creating 
the the law, the narrative of the, of sure, the miniatures. Yeah. Or the, I mean, are you using the upgrade packs? Are you using the Imperial Fist upgrade not packs? The You're not. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was gonna say because I I, I I find the building side of it to be like the bit where you just add like the 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 the, the soul of the, the of the models and the character and stuff like that. So that's really interesting. But then at the same time. The edge, the edge highlighting as a as a technique or as an execution is quite. A, it involves a lot of focus and a lot of mm. interest and a lot of, to make sure you get it right. And then so, we hear people saying all the time, oh, "I hate edge yeah, highlighting." Yeah, yeah, it's my yeah, least favorite exactly, part. Yeah. So it's just really interesting. But like George said, like it's it, everyone's different approach and different angle is is super interesting because ultimately we're all trying to get to the same position, yeah. having a nicely presented army, whatever stand, whatever you your goal is for the project. Um, but all the different sort of side alleys and ways to get there always makes it super it interesting. It's the great thing about the hobby. It's exactly the same in the books. We all di we all enjoy, enjoy different things, different avenues of it, different aspects of it. And it relates exactly the same to the painting aspect. We all yeah, enjoy yeah. it in a different way. 100%, yeah. I think it's, it's, I find it simultaneously like the best and the worst part about the hobby is how much of it there is. Because on the one hand, there's a lane for you that is just what you enjoy and you get to do that. Yeah. But on the other side, I've, I think part of why it made me feel so daunting for for newbies is because it's just such this massive yeah. world and there's no, even though people talk about like nice entry points, there's no great way to start. <laughs> you kind of just got to go in. Yeah, you, you got to dive in. There's all the painting side of stuff. There's all the gaming. So, I mean, the gaming side of stuff is its own Everest in itself yeah. and so on. So yeah, that does interest me. Yeah. What What are your thoughts? Have you seen that new book by DK that's coming out? That's that kind of, there's a there's a new book that was announced on Community. So I might not have seen it. I, I'll, I'll have to send you the link. But there's okay. but it, essentially just to just shoot from the hip, it's a book that they've brought out that essentially has all the factions and about forty k as a snapshot in like. Do you remember the old DK books that explained about like uh, about IPs and about like yeah. the, they've brought out this amazing book. Um, it's called the ultimate guide. Um, and essentially it, it, it runs through all the stuff on 40 K basically, but it's like, okay. it's like, it gives you like a double page spread about blood angels, a double page spread about Santa, like different chapters and different factions. And it, I, I think that as a, <clears throat> as a really good kind of like almost injection into somebody new to put it in that terminology, not that that's probably a good, I don't think just for someone new, because I think there's a tendency for, I mean, we're perfect examples. This. I think there's a tendency for people that even are established in it because they have their favorite thing. They stay quite narrow and you don't really learn yeah. a lot about leaks of Votan because you're a Space Marines <laughs> fan. Do you know what I mean? I feel like yeah, you can get, no. uh, especially as the world expands, what, you might start out, you might like read a little bit of everything and learn a little bit about everything and paint some different models. Then you find the faction and the army that you like and you stick to that for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, the rest of the Warhammer world has been expanding and evolving outside of that. And you're almost- You sound like you've got some regrets. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. well, I do think that would be a really great entry point for people. The the book, book, that book, that yeah. new book is amazing. Yeah, I'll have to link you to it. And um, It sounds not too dissimilar from the first founding one they released last year, I think, which was literally just a bit of a guide on the first founding chapters. And you had a couple of pages on each one and some basic lore and things like that. It's, so. it's very similar to that. Yeah, but it, I think it covers the full span of 40K, which is, yeah. which is, which is awesome. I mean, I remember I, one of my favorite things from back in the day, when specifically Second Ed, was you got the you obviously got the rule book you had the war gear book yeah. and then you had the i can't remember what the other book was called it was the one that had the same artwork as the cover mm -hmm. art and it broke down it was a really nice way that it broke it down into three different areas so if you've got the rule book you can obviously just read that and then the war gear one was really interesting because mm -hmm. you kind of learned the races and factions through the war gear as well which is quite yeah good. and you know, I, I, technically you can kind of still do that in the rule book but it's just a lot more daunting now in the rule books you know like an, <laughs> like an inch thick and you've yeah. got to try and find the part that is going to grip you somewhere no but, definitely uh, yeah, yeah they i think doing like a guide something like that for more not necessarily newer people but something that kind of takes away the, the daunting aspect yeah. of it is definitely a good way to yeah go. it reduces the everest a little bit which yeah. is which is quite yeah good. what do you think's uh next in terms of the law what do you think's coming in the yeah, horizon? Well, some predictions. Well, I, I'm still waiting for the Lionel Johnson and Gilliman to meet up again uh, since L. Johnson's return. That's been something I've been eagerly anticipating ever since he um, woke up next to the river in the, yeah. uh, next to the Caliban. But um, that's got to come. It's, it's kind of felt like it's kind of been a little bit of a standstill over the past year, maybe since L. Johnson come back. We haven't had a big a big leap since then, but they've subtly, if you've been reading all the main novels, they've subtly been built into uh, Gilliman's crossing of the rift at the Attilum gates, I believe, if my memory serves. Yeah. And We're not so, going to test you, don't worry. Yeah, don't right. worry, we don't know <laughs> yeah, either. Don't worry. <laughs> right, it's, fine. it's definitely Attilum something. <laughs> but it, that is, 
they've been building to that teasing for that slowly so it's it's got to be the next big stage will be Gilliman's crossing of the rift where that's going to go who knows um considering l johnson's over there it's got to slowly surely build to them finally reuniting and deciding upon uh, what kind of future they're going to get how the yeah. two are going to get along i'm sure they're both going to work along uh, with each other very well these days but they have got a history so it's quite it does a make it more interesting massive yeah i honestly never thought that we would get another primark comeback i thought i was amazed and stunned that we got gilliman come back which changed everything that you had ever known from the law yeah i really wasn't sure if they were going to bring any more loyal primarks back because once you start yeah you yeah. can't the stop. gloves are off yeah. yeah yeah so then now well johnson has come back and then surely it's only a matter of time till the rest of them come back yeah, I was gonna say it's a bit like a it's a bit like one of those old WWF matches that you used to watch where you'd have one person, one person, I think like King of the Ring or something, you'd have one person who's like on his own, that's Gulliman, and then all these other wrestlers are coming in and, and fighting, yeah. and he's like, I need some tag team buddies here. Like so Lionel Johnson waking up and coming back is great. Um what are your predictions for other Primarchs coming back then? Because I'd love to I'd love to I, put your brain on now that. Now I generally think they all the loyal ones, other than the ones who are definitely dead, will they're all gonna come back. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to see, I'd love to see Russ come back. Um, uh, not as some weird werewolf beast. Yeah, I, don't I, want I, I just wanted, I just wanted to come back like a, like a, a like a, like an almost like a Thor, like eye patch, like yeah. old and like super bitter and like what the hell was going on? I went away on holiday and I come back and like everything's gone gone to rubbish. Yeah, well, I didn't expect El Johnson to come back the way he's come back. He, for thirty years, we were told that he um, he lived. Well, he was asleep under the rock. Yeah, you know, and then. He didn't come back for that. He came back somewhere completely differently. So it might not necessarily be how we all expect, you know. But, yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely think Russ will come back. I don't think he'll be the very last one to come back because no. of the wolf time. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that matters at all. He will definitely come back. I think we'll see some teases and developments to do with Rogel because essentially he's, he was dead and now his body's disappeared and only his hand was found. So we'll get some more teases over the next following years about Rogel. Mm. Jagger is a very easy one to come back because he's in the webway somewhere. He's and the one that interests me the most because it's just, I love it, I, it, just because like, just because of the way like the, he's super like guarded of how he is and all that kind of stuff. And like that scene where they're all the Primarchs together in 30K and like they're like, Fulgham's like, oh, I'm the best swordsman. And then he just goes, well, you haven't seen me fight. Like that. Yeah. It just like, I think, I think he's got this amazing kind of like ability to just come out of nowhere. And I'd actually think it'd be quite cool if he came back just random, like they just brought him back, and that'd yeah. be, that'd be so fitting for his character and like yeah, and how it, how he how he would be. In terms of all of them coming back, I'd be quite interested to see what the pace is going to be going forward. Because obviously, you say that everything was very very stagnated. Mm. Then Gilliman came back. Then we had a little bit of a break, and then now the Lions back. So I, I wonder, will there maybe be a turning point where they just decide? Screw it, and then what, just wrap it together, right. you know, like no, the Avengers. It's that, but... scene in WWE, it's that scene in wrestling where they all run down the gangway, like they all, all come out the back, everyone comes out. Yeah, um, I, there's got to be some kind of a couple of years span between them, at least I would have thought. Well, it's a big, it's, it's a big thing them coming back. I mean, I, I in the when um, the Thousand Sons were on um, Femris, there was a bit where I can't remember if it was uh, Ragnar or someone. They said he was looking across the battlescape, and he thought he saw Russ like walking amongst amongst the. I, can't, I don't amongst, remember it's in, that. It's in the um, it's when the Thousand Sons were on were on uh, on Femris in yeah. the most recent when they recently went to Femris. Um, there's like a passing one of my friends Tris is like a massive Space Wolf fan so he like he literally he's, he's as crazy as Space Wolf as I'm, I am on Blood Angels and he said there was this segment of text in one of the bits where it was said that it was as if Russ was seen just on the like walking walking amongst the rest of the Space Wolves or something but like kind of like un unknowingly if that makes yeah. sense but if he comes I think Russ would be quite cool to come back next I think because I think you've got the Fulgrim is I'd imagine he's probably the next pri evil Primark to come back. Definitely feels that Just way. Just feels that way, yeah. And I think when you look at all the models and things that, are, that have been released and stuff, yeah. it's interesting because Gulliman's got that, that obviously that that grudge with Fulgrim because mm -hmm. obviously of his neck being cut, et cetera. Pretty and much killed him. Pretty much know? killed him, yeah. And then I think that, yeah, like Russ would make, in my opinion, would make sense personally. I don't know. Yeah. L. Johnson definitely felt like the logical one to come back after Gilliman. Yeah, 100%. That never felt in doubt. It felt like that was the way it was definitely going to go. I could see Russ coming back next, but it also feels like a much more open book. It yeah. feels like they could really go anywhere they want to now. Jagatai again, he's literally just in the webway. Yeah, yeah. Considering like Vashtor maybe ripping up the webway right now, that definitely leads an avenue. If they wanted to bring Jagatai back, they can. 
Rogel is a hugely popular character, but he feels like the most difficult Primarch to bring back at the moment because he, out of all of them, he is the most mysterious. We don't really know what's happened to him at this point. Mm. Corax, we know, is in the eye of terror, or at least he was. Doing, his, in, doing his Batman thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doing his Batman thing after Lorgar, but technically he's after all the traitor Primarchs, so you could do a thing where he's currently hunting Fulgrim. If Fulgrim comes back, then Korax can follow him after. So yeah. it is, it's kind of like a, I've said it a few times over the years, but it's kind of like a golden age of lore at the moment where anything can happen. Yeah. What yeah. do you, what are maybe some predictions for outside of Space Marines? What are some other things you think we might see from the universe? Well, I don't know about predictions, but I want to know what's going on with the Eldari at the moment because... Again, Vashtor's kind of tearing up the webway as far as it feels to me at the moment, trying to find his secret vault that he's got the key for now. And we don't really know what's going on with the Eldar. So I want to know what's going on. It, it feels like there should be a massive war going on behind the scenes that we haven't seen yet. And nothing's really happened with them since the uh, Yanari turned up. Mm. So they're... They're due for a bit of interesting time. Interestingly, like. they're due some models yeah, as well. They I'm, are. I'm a little bit ignorant as to how the book releases work, but do they tend to follow new because obviously in the in the miniatures space, things tend to get updated at a certain cadence of based mm. on like what's old and what's relevant and whatnot. Yeah. Do the books perhaps follow that at all? Or are they kind of free to do their own thing? I'm not really sure. I, I neither, to be honest yeah, with you. Because yeah. like if, if you're saying like the, the Eldaria perhaps drew some story, they're obviously drew some miniatures because they're ancient. So I wonder if they would tie those two things together. Because obviously like with Vashtor and things like that, obviously miniatures came alongside it. With yeah. Gulliman, miniatures came alongside it. So Yeah, yeah there's, it, it is a difference between like the novels and a campaign. If, it, if it's a campaign focus, then obviously the miniatures are much more tied in closely with that. Novels, not necessarily as much. I feel like... Um, I don't know. I've got no knowledge whatsoever, but I feel like it, it definitely ties around what, what sells mm -hmm. because we, we got a rush of Eldari novels a few years ago and then it just kind of stopped. And it feels like to me that maybe that's because they weren't particularly popular stories. So. I think they're some of the most interesting characters because they, because they do have such a rich history of obviously the, the, they're one of the oldest races other than obviously the Satan or Necrons yeah. on the frontier. Like, um, but yeah, I, 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 it's interesting that they're bringing out a couple of plastic Phoenix Lords. So we've got obviously Jane Jar. You've obviously got Margan Ra. The new, and I, like Carandris is one that I would love to see a plastic model of. Well, like, uh, you know, they're giving uh, them some attention in the sense of they've got new Guardians, they've got the Warlocks. They've had yeah. a couple of kits, but they haven't had anything new really. Yeah, definitely more to come. And, and again, maybe, hopefully, that's something to tie in with them having a bit more of an important role in the lore as well. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Do you know, do you know one thing that I think that uh, has has gone kind of like super quiet, like, and I think it's probably one of the most interesting subspace marine laws is mm. Legion of the Damned. Like, yeah. Legion of the Damned are like super interesting as like, as a, I, I don't even know whether to call them a chapter because of obviously the ghostly yeah. kind of nature that they are, but there's obviously things about like, the emperor being in the webway, like he's sawing the webway and seeing like Ferris Manus, like, yeah. you know, and all this kind of stuff with like loads of flaming marine. Like, like it's just like, I think Legion of them for me are like one of them, what they are like a super interesting, really sort of niche of a niche of a niche yeah. thing that have got potentially a huge implement impl implications in the law and what they can and can't do. And it's just, yeah. uh, that they're, they're something that has always interested yeah, me. Um, probably a few years ago now, but I remember doing a conversation about what, what's going on with them. What's the way, where have they gone? You know, cause they've just, They've always been around and they've always been iconic miniatures, obviously, but they never, over the past couple of years, it feels like they've kind of stepped back. Yeah, and, definitely. And, and they've kind of lost that mythical position that they had every now and again, they'd turn up, save the day, you know. And go for, go for lunch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then like you said, um, then we got the moment in Master of Mankind uh, where Ferris was sighted. Yeah, uh, yeah. The Emperor's power and it kind of felt very much like a Legion of the Damned style thing. Definitely, yeah. And there've been sightings over, there, over time since then, but they've, again, they're due for something. Yeah, I think could, so. It could tie in with the Star Child narrative that's going on at the moment in the Dawn of Fire series. So yeah, amazing. Yeah, well, fingers crossed. I'd, I'd absolutely love Legion of that model. So it'd just yeah. be nice to get some new ones. But yeah, if you're a long-term listener of the podcast, you'll know how important it is to have the right tools to aid you in your painting. And if there's one piece of equipment that I could never live without, it's my Onyx lamp from Native Lighting. It doesn't matter what brush or paints you have if you can't see what you're doing in the first place. The Onyx is the perfect lamp for miniature painting because it's super bright, 2200 lumen LEDs cast soft and diffused light on your models without any harsh shadows. 
and its daylight balanced color temperature of 6500K gives you the confidence that the colors you are painting are accurate. As someone with a very small hobby desk, by far my favorite feature though is its articulating arm, which clamps to the side of your desk, maximizing your workspace. It's also super adjustable so you can sit comfortably in the perfect painting position without sacrifice. It also folds up into a compact shape, which is great if you like to travel to paint with your friends. To upgrade your setup and order yours now, head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop or head to the link in this episode's description. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer on a future episode of the podcast, please do leave it in the comments down below. Uh, this week, our question is, uh, does anyone have any tips or tricks on how to avoid eye strain every time I have a long painting session, I end up with a terrible headache afterwards? This is going to be, I'm, I'm going to jump in the swimming pool first on this and just say this is with a caveat of not knowing your painting setup or what it is that you're that you're using and things like that. Um, I, I think probably one of the root causes for a lot of eye strain tends to be the on two avenues the first one is lighting and this isn't a chance for me to plug an onyx but i'm just saying lighting, <laughs> lighting is very important obviously um the other avenue is is obviously your vision and i think one of the things that, i mean obviously if, if joe were here he'd be flying the flag for the old uh the old the magnifying, magnifying well glasses. that was funny because joe said uh he he's always been a big advocate for them uh magnifying headsets and saying how amazing they are and then he eventually found out that he just needs glasses. <laughs> he had an eye test, and it turns out he just couldn't see. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, but like those those are those are those vision glasses. Uh, vision glasses. Those magnifying glasses are actually are very very good as well. So it could potentially be that. I, sorry to sound like uh, like someone that actually genuinely cares. I genuinely do care. Go get an eye test. And yeah. that, that might be that might be the first thing. If it's not that, then I, I'd suggest looking at lighting. Um, you know, that there's there's all manner of things like it's also like. Po going in a bit of a segue like posture is also really important like we talk about having a, a good chair or being a, being comfortable while you're doing it if you're straining of any form whether it's like eye strain or physical strain holding the miniature or like the brush or the position or whatever it all builds up and 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 pressure like with regards regards to what headaches and stuff that could be leading not only from posture it could be from the way you're bracing it could be from the way that you're that you're, the model's not lit up enough i've had it before where it's been a summer's day and i've you've been using my daylight and in fact, I've had too much light on the on the miniature, and I've had to close the curtain so that it it counterbalances how bright my light is, and yeah. it's not too much, you know. Um, Lighting is really really important. I think if anything, you can do to make your your life easier. It's like it's it's a factor you can just eliminate. Yeah, it's like one of the variables that you need to just not even be relevant. You need to yeah. have really really nice good quality lighting from above, soft and diffused. I think additionally, this might sound a little bit silly, but especially as painting can be something that people do for a lot of hours. And you're sat in a chair and you kind of, you've got your audio book on or whatever and you kind of get like super focused. Well, one thing that I found that uh, was really, really important is, is drink water. Yeah. Like just staying hydrated while you paint. I know not that we like high performance athletes or anything, <laughs> but, but what you haven't got a treadmill under your desk. <laughs> it's like, it's like, got a protein <laughs> chain. Yeah. Yeah. Lifting the dumbbell while working. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. ultimately, if you are sitting there painting for four or five hours, very, very intensely focused, yeah. especially in like warmer weather and things like that, it is something that's easy to forget about. Yeah. And when you are starting to get headaches and things like that, you're straining your eyes and you're focusing, that that can be something that's maybe relevant i'm not sure no definitely yeah. Yeah, have you had experiences with like with like eye strain and stuff like that or like yeah, headaches well and i actually did work more so for using the computer when i'm editing my videos and stuff like that but i was getting constant eye strain mm -hmm. went for an eye test at the end of the day and they found something that had never been found before and it's actually a birth defect on the back of my eye oh right so it, it just Again, like you said, it's really simple, but just go get your eyes checked. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. really no, yeah, I agree. I do yeah. agree. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but it's it's something you just never think about and take um, you take for granted, don't you? That we, we can see. But yeah. Again, this is something that apparently I've had my entire life that I didn't even know about and had never even been seen or detected before. Oh right. Oh. It's literally just the back of my right eye didn't form the way it should do when I was oh, I right. was born a couple of months premature. So I guess maybe oh, right. that was the problem. But um yeah, just go get go get your eyes checked, even if you you got them checked, you know, six months ago. If you're finding that you're getting strained, it's coming from somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and and like like with anything, like uh, aging, unfortunately, things do deteriorate. I mean, like I'm just shy of forty, and like and and like my vision is getting slightly worse as I get older, and that's just something that unfortunately you just need to 
deal with and, and, and try and make the situation as best as possible. And there will come a period when you, when you maybe do yeah. need to wear glasses or contacts. Not or, even, I don't even or, think it's just an age thing either because, I mean, I'm also quite young, but I'd always worn glasses since I was very, very young. It's only recently that I've actually not needed them. Yeah. So it, it, being regular with like getting your eyes tested is, is important as well, like you said, because things can yeah. change. I mean, I could end up needing glasses again. Yeah, well, exactly. And, and you don't necessarily need glasses all the time, do you? No. If you're, if you're painting in particular, you're focusing on small, intricate models. You may just need glasses for that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's, yeah. Definitely. I mean, the, the, the final thing I'll say on it, I think, and something that, that I think is very beneficial is taking breaks as well. I know you mentioned about drinking water, maybe even factory in a water break as well as an eye break. Yeah. Like, I know it sounds silly, but like, there's multiple benefits and virtues to that. It's like number one, you 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 when you're focusing on something close and intently, you are you are staring, which is ultimately straining of the eye. And at the same time, because you're so hyper focused on it, sometimes you become almost a bit blind to what you're painting. And what I mean by that is that you're so intently looking at it that you don't always see things mm. the way that you would naturally look at them if you glanced at it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So particularly in terms of like mistakes and things correct, like that. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So having a, what we call it a fresh eyes break, having that fresh eyes break to go get a drink, go, go, go walk the dog. Stretch for, your legs. Stretch your legs, go yeah. walk the dog for an hour or like something like that. Um, is actually better because when you come back to it, your eyes have reset and you can notably see things that, because, that you wouldn't have seen from staring at it for so long, so intently. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, I think factoring in some fresh eye breaks and some, you know, just getting an eye test and maybe getting better lighting if you haven't got good lighting or all those different things. If if all of that doesn't solve it, then I don't know what the answer is. So, so it's, it's some, yeah. here's something though that I say we're not doctors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's something that I've definitely experienced a lot though, because when I was painting professionally full time for several years, painting for 10 hours a day, five, six days a week, it really, really does build up and it, it becomes so easy to, it seems like so cliche or like you, feel like your mum like nagging you to like stand <laughs> up and drink some water but like the, it is really really important especially on an ongoing basis it might feel like you don't need to do it right now but that bad habit over five yeah. ten years is is the result of a, a lot of pain that could have been avoided i think yeah definitely yeah. okay well uh on that note i think we'll round it out there massive thank you wolf lord Rowe, oh, for coming on the podcast uh, where can everyone find all of your content yeah uh, well it's pretty straightforward wolf lord row over on youtube so yeah head over there check me out if you're new to the law or if you've loved it for years, uh, I'm sure I've got a conversation somewhere for you. <laughs> what do you think is uh, maybe a, a good video that you'd recommend people watch oh, if man. they haven't seen your channel? What's one of your favorites? I do so many conversations. Picking a single favorite one <laughs> is extremely hard to do. But uh, <laughs> pretty much any conversation. We stumped him there. It's good. <laughs> you have stumped me there. But at the moment, I'm talking about the relationship between Lionel Johnson and Conrad Kurz. And I'm enjoying those conversations. Oh, so awesome. pretty much just dive into the last three, four uploads. And that's probably the perfect example of, of what I do on the channel. Amazing. Well, another thank you very, very much. Uh, and thank you for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. We're going to jump over now to the post-show bonus segment for our patrons. So if you uh, would like to get some more Paint Perspective content in your life, then uh, considering signing up to our Patreon would be a great way to do that. Uh, as well as the bo bonus post show of the podcast. There's a lot of P's there. You'll also gain access to uh, hundreds of high quality PDF tutorials, which we update every single week. Otherwise, massive thank you for watching the episode and we'll see you next week. That changed 40K completely and utterly. They felt unique. They felt different. They had a, a freedom. So when you've got a book that follows, say, two main protagonists at once, I always find that they are the best stories.